Good morning. Welcome to this broadcast service of worship. I've called it Obeying the Spirit of Truth. First, let us pray to God, the eternal trinity of love and power. Praise be to your name, eternal maker and upholder of all creation, of all that has been, all that is, and all that is to be, source of all love and righteousness, all creativity and beauty, all grace and peace, the way of life for all. Praise be to your name, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. By your life you've redeemed the world and given comfort and peace, healing and health of body, mind and spirit. You are the way of salvation for all. Praise be to your name, Spirit of Truth. Your witness creates and confirms our witness. Your guidance is our direction. Your truth is our good news for all. Let us join in the Lord's Prayer in the modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. About that time, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenists made a complaint against the Hebrews in the daily distribution, their own widows were being overlooked. So the Twelve called a full meeting of the disciples and addressed them. It would not be right for us to neglect the word of God so as to give out food. You, brothers, must select from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, filled with the spirit and wisdom, to whom we can hand over this duty. We ourselves will continue to devote ourselves to prayer and to the service of the word. The whole assembly approved of this proposal and elected Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicolaus of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these, the disciples, uh, to the apostles, and after prayer, they laid their hands on them. The word of the Lord continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem was greatly increased, and a large group of priests made their submission to the faith. A personal note. It's 80 years since I prepared my very first sermon. The war was in its fourth year and I was on an army course in central London, giving me an opportunity to speak to the men's class of my childhood, a childhood Wesleyan church in the London suburb. I spoke of the salvation wrought through the crucifixion of the Lord of Glory. Today, the last time I'm likely to preach the gospel publicly, the theme is that of salvation. Philip, go along the road that leads from Jerusalem down to Gaza. The word was unmistakable. Philip hadn't the slightest idea why he'd right, go right, to go right away from his duties and from his successful preaching mission. God only knows, he might have said to the fellowship when he told them of his call. And God did know. Our hero, the Holy Spirit, was already at work in the life of a stranger from right away south, the very source of the Blue Nile. 
the Queen's treasurer of Ethiopia, was no doubt wealthy. He travelled first class by chariot. There was no doubt about the, uh, no doubt by the courtesy of the Kandaki of the Queen, but he was also devout. His pilgrimage, which may have been official or personal, but his seeking for the truth of the scriptures was certainly personal. But there was a plan in his journey of which the Kandaki knew nothing. Perhaps copies of prophetic books were scarce in his own country. He'd been guided to buy a new copy of Isaiah while he was in Jerusalem. His eye was led to an obscure passage from the 53rd chapter. These songs of the suffering servant were not currently central to the thinking of a Gentile proselyte. Led like a lamb to the slaughter, Yet ours were the sufferings he was bearing, ours the sorrows he was carrying. He was being wounded by our, for our rebellions, crushed because of our guilt. The punishment reconciling us fell on him, and we've been healed by his bruises. Read the Ethiopian from his precious copy of Isaiah. He was on a desert road. Why hadn't he seen this passage two day nights ago in Jerusalem when he could have found a learned scribe or a wise rabbi who could have told him the official interpretation? What was the latest thinking about the second Isaiah? What were they saying in the school of Gamaliel? He looked at the parched, gullied countryside around him who around here was likely to know Hebrew and Greek? And then, as the chariot rounded a curve in the road, there walking ahead of him, cheerfully twirling his staff and moving briskly as if he hadn't a care in the world, was a Jew, neatly dressed in the Hellenic manner. The thoroughbreds passed him at a smart trot and the dust from the wheels billowed up behind the chariot almost hiding the Jew as the Ethiopian felt impelled to lean forward and call to the chariot to pull over and stop. Like a lamb to the slaughterhouse, he read out again. Deacon Philip had had plenty of time to think about the mission he'd accomplished in Samaria and the next development in his sermon construction or perhaps the organisation of relief for poor widows who were now scattered in the persecution. Jerusalem soon faded from sight amongst the hills behind him. The early sun beat on his back as he strode southeast, past Emmaus and down towards the Gaza plain. Sixty miles, unless he had a lift. It would be a three-day march to get there, or even more. And there was little but desert until you went down to Egypt. He was happy, though. His wife had wanted to take the girls up the coast to their old, their old home in Caesarea, and he joined them there when the time was ripe. It felt as if he was where God wanted him to be, and that was enough. He swung his stick cheerfully and grinned at the richly dressed man who passed him in a grand chariot with a small escort of horsemen. A hundred years further on, the whole group pulled up. Here's the job I've set you, Philip. Get on with it. Join this chariot. The voice of the spirit was almost audible. He broke into a run. As he came up to the vehicle, he heard a foreign-sounding voice reading out from the Greek version of the prophets. Like a lamb led to the slaughterhouse, the very passage he discussed with Peter and John in Samaria so very recently. Coincidence or guidance? Do you understand what you're reading? Are you a Greek speaking, sir? Philip asked politely in that language. As his name implied, he was himself a Hellenistic Jew, more at home in the colloquial Greek language than Aramaic or Hebrew. 
How could I unless I have someone to guide me? I'm an Ethiopian and I'm familiar with the scriptures up to a point, but this passage from Isaiah is puzzling me. Is the prophet speaking of his own sufferings? You look like someone who might explain the latest views of the authorities on this passage. Are you familiar with it? When it happens, I and my friends have been paying a lot of attention to the prophecies about the Christ recently. We've had good reason to do so. Can I help? Will it be taking you out of your way? We're travelling home via Gaza and Egypt. Why not sit up here and make yourself comfortable and explain what this Isaiah is getting at? What part has suffering in salvation? The message of good news for seekers after salvation starts in the scriptures of the people of God. It can only be fully received when those preparatory insights are married to the experience of the Christ who died for our sins and was raised for our salvation. It's the presence of the living God which changes words and ideas into faith and conversion. The Holy Spirit who brought together the man who was seeking enlightenment and the man who was bearer of good news, is also the interpreter of prophecy, the bringer of contrition and forgiveness, the converter of life and the builder of faith. Philip was the man who made the connection. His obedience and his study and his ability to communicate were his own, but also the work of the Spirit within him. And the Spirit had done a mighty work during that drive down through the foothills of Judea. A roadside watering home came into view. The important official had no hesitation. No false pride prevented his impulse to share publicly in the humiliation of baptism, even in the presence of his escort and his servants. Evangelist and catechumen together stood in the water. And symbolically, the Ethiopian not only demonstrated the washing away of his old life, but also entered the death of Jesus in the symbol and emerged to new life in the spirit. Our hero, the Holy Spirit, had achieved a great work in yet another. With the stripes of Christ, the man was healed. Through him, God's good pleasure had been done. Christ, the upright one, had justified another convert by taking his guilt upon himself. In baptism, the Ethiopian eunuch had identified himself with his Saviour, and he went on his way rejoicing. He was no doubt sorry to part with Philip, but now he had a faith which travelled with him, and he who could father no one in the flesh was no doubt father to many in God. For the Holy Spirit leaves no one to stand and stay at the point of conversion, full of joy though they may be. As Paul assures us, the work of the Spirit is to go on perfecting us, completing us, until we reflect Christ entirely. Philip's work was done here, but more awaited him on the road north again, and as he made to his, his way to Caesarea, preaching as he went, he too had a further pilgrimage and an eternal destiny. So have you. Are you alert to the guidance of the Holy Spirit as you take your road to the future? Amen. A time for prayer.
Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, through Jesus Christ you've assured your children of eternal life and in baptism have made us one in him. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in Christ. For he is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord Christ, who at your ascension told your infant church to preach the good news of your salvation to all the world, we give you thanks that you have called to the service of proclamation men and women of every nation and have through them declared your word of grace to all nations and brought many to penitence and new life. Grant that in this age and this place you will have many who will answer your call to preach and teach your word and through them bring the blessing of salvation to our generation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that your church may so nurture each of us that we are taught your mysteries and learn to translate and share them with all we meet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give to all, powerful and powerless, the grace of a faithful response to the word, that the kingdoms of this world may become your kingdom of love and service, and that aggression, violence and greed of the world may be defeated. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, who suffered and triumphed for this world, Fill every member of your body, the Church, with a spirit of courage, direction, wisdom, that each may truly become one who by life and word sets before neighbour and family the example of a holy life and the warmth of love that can touch the soul, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit to convert those who witness your grace in action. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayer, Father, and what we lack in imagination or breadth of mind, enlarge for the sake of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our benediction. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to none evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all folk. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen.